very exciting news on July 22nd the grand tournament was announced releasing August sometime there uh, the grand tournament is going to be an expansion 130 plus cards similar to similar in size to goblins versus gnomes and it's focused on the theme of hero ability because you the champion the heroes are the main focus of the grand tournament with that they've added a new mechanic called inspire inspire is a card that goes off after you use your hero ability each time so whenever you press that button on your hero inspire goes off giving you extra value and i'm very happy about that because it encourages longer games encourages you to make your make use of your hero ability more the choice to use the hero ability is often a tough one so uh, it's going to increase the skill the decision making of the game that's the positive part of inspire the negative side of inspire is that the inspire cards have to be slower and they have to be less good stat wise because otherwise they'd be op so oftentimes you have to almost balance the cards around like expecting them to cost two more mana because of the inspire effect you play the card you push the hero power and that might mean that the cards are too slow to use and that face hunter will dominate so will we live in a world where control is given the opportunity to handle this aggro and inspire gets its chance to gain value over time or will face hunter rule the day and like board control cards will they control your cards so that you can't use the inspire find out next month go into the cards though we start with the lowly squire a nice basic showing of how inspire is meant to work uh, i played in the july 22nd event where Blizzard announced the expansion. Amaz, playing the Shaman deck, played two Lowly Squires against me on turn one, and then proceeded to hit the hero ability on turn two, making them into two twos. And that was still not very impressive. This card's going to be pretty bad when you top deck it late game, and if it wasn't even good in the early game on for turn one, uh, it's going to see no use in constructed. Uh, base stats are just too weak, and over time it can be made to be stronger but it's just too slow an arena a format where it's a bit slower uh, it having two health and being able to survive hero abilities is going to be more important by the way it's going to be even more important that cards are able to survive one health in arena now because you're going to be encouraged to use your hero ability so you want to play an inspire card and then fire blast or inspire card and then shape shift even in decks where you want to do a turn two hero ability for example lowly squire lowly squire rogue hero ability on turn two i think it's still no good because it's just too slow and the card is so weak individually that you don't even want it in the late game. Like in the late game you can actually play it with the Inspire immediately, but then it's just a 1 mana 2-2 two -two and it's just not good enough. Garrison Commander. This one's a nice card to put into your Inspire type deck, your late game control value type deck. Uh, 2 mana 2-3 two, is fine stats and the bonus is very relevant because, well of course with Inspire, using the hero power gives you power and being able to use it twice that just sounds about right uh, because realistically even though with inspire you're getting bonuses you can't really still afford to use a hero power that many times and there's going to be a card later on that i'll review which will be able to use your power as many times as you want to turn but that turns out to be like too much often so being able to use it twice that's a nice bonus I expect to see this card in the Inspire type control decks if Inspire is a thing. And I'm going to, moving forward, review the cards assuming that Inspire control type decks is going to work. So I'm going to add like the asterisk right now in my later reviews and in this review. If Inspire turns out to be too slow, then like all these cards are actually just based off of stats, not entirely good. How is Garrison Commander too slow in Face Hunter? It's really interesting how uh, Inspire is going to work differently in every class, and 
how the hero ability is going to work in every class. But when you think about it, 6 mana, 2, 3, deal 4 damage is just not very good. And that's a simple reason why uh, these inspire type or hero power mechanics, they tend to be over the long run, therefore not very well suited to aggressive decks, I think. But maybe there are going to be aggressive cards with inspire on them. But then I would think about like how can you even make a aggressive inspire card because by the virtue of being a card with inspire on it like inspire is a major bonus or maybe a minor bonus so you can't make the stats too good so it's tough for an aggressive card to be made with inspire because if you make a card have good stats and have inspire on it that just makes the card too good probably. Uh, in Arena, this card will be very good, just as a solid 2-mana two 2-3 two, with a nice bonus. So of course it'll be good. Silverhand Regent. This is another nice kind of small bonus for the Inspire. 3-mana, three 3-3, three, three, reasonable stats. Inspire summon a 1-1 one, one Silverhand Recruit. This is the type of Inspire card, uh, very similar to the Lowly Squire, which is a nice bonus, but is probably not a big enough effect to matter. Like, the stats, they're not that good. The Inspire, it's very minor. Uh, very interesting that you can get 1-1 Silverhand Recruits in other classes now. And here's an interesting thing to think about when it comes to Inspire. It's almost like you have two different ways to play it. Like, you can play it at the mana curve, so you can just play a 3-mana three 3-3, three, three, and that's kind of reasonable. Or you can think of it as, like, a 5-mana card where you're using it in your, with your hero ability, so... Like, let's say you played in Paladin, you're playing 5 mana, and you're getting 3 mana, 3, 3, and 2 mana, uh, and 2 one ones. That's kind of interesting. I imagine, after all, you would want the Silverhand region in a deck where you were focusing on making guys, and Paladin just makes sense because you have Quartermaster. But yeah, here's the problem with Inspire. It takes some time to get working, and in a class that's going to use the hero power, for the most part, this is a 5 mana, 4, 4 with your hero power, whatever it is. Uh, is that going to be too slow? If the effect is this minor, probably. Uh, in Arena, though, this card's going to be amazing because it's going to be slow enough that you can use this ability. And a 3 mana 3 3, that's okay. Maiden of the Lake. This is a pretty exciting card, which gives me hope for Inspire because I believe this is one of the first cards, possibly the first card, without like a crippling drawback, like Pit Lord where it's a 4 mana 6 health minion. So that's a big deal because control decks like cards which have a high amount of health. This obviously is a card that really benefits the Inspire theme. I expect it to be a staple in most decks that run Inspire cards. She's a nice lady that's gonna help you out. Uh, not much to say, it's just a very sturdy card. In Arena, this card is just uh, emphasizes value, so it should work out too. And you can actually play this card unlike other Inspire type cards which want to use the hero ability immediately. Like instead of plus two, you can play this on turn four or turn five. Uh, it feels like this can be used in nearly every deck. Water Elemental, Oasis Snapjaw. Okay, Snapjaw sucks, Water Elemental is a mage card. And obviously the point is four mana, six health is rare. One thing to remember is that this card says your hero power costs 1, not your hero power is reduced by 1, so if you have 2 Maiden of the Lakes out and your hero power does not go to 0, which is both a little bit of a shame and both understandable because of the degenerate combos that would happen. Go to Rider. Uh, 6 mana, 3, 5. So when you see 6 mana, 3, 5, the text had better be amazing for the card to be good. Bad news, the text is amazing but maybe not amazing enough. You play it either as a 6 mana 3 5, hints don't do that most of the time, or you play it as an 8 mana 3 5 3 5, so that's like an 8 mana 6 10. When you play it as an 8 mana 6 10, that's not too bad, because the stat wise it's pretty good, but the problem is it's kind of like the same reason why Karen isn't played these days, because it's too slow. You can't play something with the expectation of playing it on 8 mana and then having it only be okay on 8 mana. Uh, in Arena, this card's probably going to be reasonable enough that uh, you can keep it going. 
Now, obviously, the Coda Rider is a huge threat, so it has the added benefit of when you play it, it basically has taunt because the amount of value that you would get from pushing the hero power would be too large. Uh, this is an example of a card where if the metagame is aggro, it wouldn't work at all. And because aggro will always exist, I don't think this card will be strong enough to use. Uh, also an interesting thing about Inspire in general is that the good Inspire cards will generally basically have taunt also, just because, I mean, they'll have pseudo taunt, because the amount of value that you're getting by pushing the hero power will just be too large. I'm getting asked like questions like, oh, what if Coder Rider said this, or what if Coder Rider were that? Well, I'm not going to answer them because I don't really like what ifs. It's like the cards are just coming out. Like, what are you, what if? What if Arjun? What if the uh, Lowly Squire were a two two? What if Ross Giant cost eight? What if? Like, okay, then the card would be better. Then I'd be reviewing a different card, but that is outside the scope of things. Where are we? Frost Giant. Frost Giant. Ten mana eight eight. Another uh, cool giant. Um, Blizzard developer Eric Dodd said something along the lines of how Blizzard thinks giants are cool. I also think giants are cool because giants represent a different way to play the game. Like you actually have to work towards a secondary goal in order for the giant to be good. This one is kind of a long-term plan giant. There's no way you're ever playing this on turn four like mountain giant. Cool thing is that you don't have to have it in your hand for the hero power discount to go on. Um, a lot of people looked at this card and immediately thought, oh, handlock, they use their hero power a lot. But I think some people misvalue like how often the handlock actually uses their hero power. Yes, they use it on turn two, and yes, they use it on turn three, but then they're usually playing a card on turn four, and then they're playing a card on turn five, and then they're playing a card on turn six, and then usually after that you start tapping and then playing a card each turn, or you're just playing your Dr. Boom on seven. But the point is, like, uh, by turn six on handlock, you usually have used your power, like on average in the games I've played, you've used it like twice. So the Frost Giant is going to be an 8 mana 8 8 still. This is not like a magical solution. Later on the game you'll probably have used a hero power something like 4 or maybe 5 times, in which case, like I think Frost Giant would be good value when you get down to 5 mana. 5 mana 8 8, so you'd have to use your hero power 5 times, that's a lot. Uh, I don't think just putting it in the handlock is a good idea. The deck that I think of immediately as being good is like a the Echo Mage, for example, where you can actually draw out the game long enough to use the hero power enough to get this to a like a 1 mana or 2 mana cost card. The problem with Echo Mage was that you would play Molten Giant, Molten Giant, and then you would echo, but that would be really reliant on your opponent damaging you down to 10 health. But if you have a long-term game plan and you're playing these frost giants for zero mana, if you get the echo of Medivh to get on them, then you're going to get another two frost giants which cost zero mana. So that could actually be a thing. I think the point is you're looking at more long-term, really slow decks for this to be good. So not just handlock, but like perhaps in Control Warrior, perhaps in Control Shaman, and uh, I note that I'm pretty happy because I'm saying that it's good in the Control decks. The problem with this card in Arena is that in Constructed, you're probably putting this card in a deck which has a purpose of like going to turn 15 to 20, and in Arena you can't really plan around that, so this card is probably going to cost a bit too much. But it's still going to be something like a 7 or 6 or 8 mana, 8-8, eight, eight, so it can be reasonable. Um, some people are wondering whether or not this would be good in Zoo, because you do, at the late game, tend to do like a hero ability and then play the card you draw. But the main problem with this in Zoo is I fear that it may get stuck with the Doom Guards, and like early game, it's just a useless card. I expect the Sea Giants are still more uh, relevant in Zoo. Compared to the other arena giants. This one's probably better than mountain giant and it's less good than sea giant but that's a wide range because sea giant is really good and mountain giant is really bad. Now we're on to the exciting legendaries. Whoa we got sky captain crag who has charge and is just about the saddest card that I've seen. Maybe the worst card of this set. 
So here's the thing to think about, and it's something that I'm really keeping in mind when I review cards now. You have to think of cards in their best case scenario, or a realistically best case scenario. So what is this card's best case? Well, realistically, I think it would be a pretty good case if you actually had three pirates out on the board, like without already ridiculously winning. So if, it, if you have three pirates, it's actually a four mana, four six with charge, which is amazing, actually. The value of a four six with charge is actually somewhere around like six mana, which when you first look at this card, it looks really, really bad. But you think about it and you're like, okay, a five mana, four six charge, that would actually be pretty good. Druids do a five mana, four four charge all the time with Druid of the Claw. So, like, to be fair, a 6 mana 4 6 charge seems right. So even though it seems like this card could be reduced to 6 mana, and it probably could, let's, let's be honest, it could be 6 mana, this card would be fair at 6 mana 4 6. Now the bad news is fair is not what you're looking for in Constructed. I think this card's mana cost is too high, and that even in a pirate deck it's just too slow, you can't really count on having your pirates on the board, it's bad. And needless to say, in Arena, it's bad. Justicar Trueheart. My goodness, that's something. Alright, Battlecry, replace your starting hero power with a better one. So you're probably wondering what a better hero ability looks like. Basically, for all the classes, that means the hero ability power is doubled. So, Priest heal for 4, Warriors armor up for 4, Mages deal 2, Druids deal 2 and gain 2 armor, Paladins get double 1-1s, one Hunter gets a 1.5 multiplier with dealing 3 damage instead of 2, Warlocks get to draw a card without having to pay 2 life, and Rogues equip a 2-2 weapon instead of a 1-2. And finally, Shamans I think got the short end of the stick, they summon a totem of their choice. Who knows, maybe debatably based on what you think, maybe Shamans didn't get the short end of the stick. I think they did. So, 6 mana, 6, 3, obviously the stats are bad, but, oh man, if you thought pushing the button was good, now when you push the button, you get almost twice the effect. That's so tasty. Those games which get into the later game, that's really, really cool. Yeah, I mean, you can summon, as a shaman, you can summon taunt totems over and over again. You can just replace them. You can, like, build up a board of seven spell damage totems, play your lava, whatever, for plus seven. It's kind of interesting, but I do think it's on the weaker side for Shaman. Card's really slow, obviously, because you have to play her and then you have to use your hero ability at least twice to break even, because you could instead just spend four mana, you would easily get a six three worth of stuff, and then use your hero ability. And then the next turn, you could just use your hero ability and you'd basically break out even. Now, also worth mentioning, this is your starting hero power, so it doesn't affect your axis for Ragnaros. Starting requirement, you need to use your hero power twice to break even with having used the hero power. Now, hero power is often not ideal of a move. So we're going to say, I'm going to put on a requirement that you basically need to use your hero power four times for this card to be good. Now the question is, is that actually feasible? You're going to be playing this on turn 6 usually, so then on turn 7 you'd have to use your hero power 8, 9, 10. That's pretty tough. Also worth mentioning that I don't think it's that much of an improvement. I guess I will start eliminating classes which I think it's not that useful for. I don't think it's that useful for Warlock because uh, losing 2 life while pain is not that big a deal. I don't think it's that useful in Shaman because I don't think controlling your totem is that important. I don't think playing it in Rogue is good because I don't think a 2-2 weapon is that impressive. And it's actually one of the hero powers that isn't even that good when you're doubling it. I don't think it's that good in Hunter because it doesn't double the power and it just makes you do one more damage each time. So in fact with the uh, Ballista shot upgrade, deal 3 damage to the enemy hero, uh, since you're spending a turn to play this, so which would be spent doing a hero power, uh, you need to do three hero powers normally to match up with two, so I don't think it's good in Hunter. So that leaves basically Druid, 
mage, paladin, priest, and warrior as notably like reasonable things. We have control warriors already where you're often going to end up being pretty late game. So I can see just a card true heart fitting in there, perhaps. Like you have to think about this card in so many classes since it does different things on the hero power. So let's compare just a card true heart to shield maiden. That's a fair comparison. Uh, you get a 5-5 with Shield Maiden instead of a 6-3 of Just a Card True Heart. Uh, advantage Shield Maiden. You're gaining 5 armor off the bat. In order to catch up with Just a Card True Heart, you'd have to use your hero power 3 times over the normal hero power. And often as Control where you're actually using the hero power a good amount of times. The main problem is Shield Maiden actually rescues you from the fast decks, whereas Just a Card True Heart takes a while to build up. So that's also a consideration to be made. Of course, in any long, drawn-out game, just the card true going to be amazing, but the question is, can you actually get the games to draw out that long? All in all, you come to the conclusion that you basically need to use the hero power three times as a warrior to justify replacing a shield maiden with it. It's even questionable, because the shield maiden does it immediately, whereas just the card true heart does it over time. And of course, shield maiden is also uh, purely good, because oftentimes you're comboing it with... Uh, with shield slam. I think one of the hero powers I most look forward to doing, especially in a control deck, is making a guy. Believe me, I salivate at the thought of making two guys when I press the button. Each time you use the hero ability, your, your hero power, you're getting a plus one one. You can even like solo combo without muster for battle now, you just push the button then you quartermaster. Just a card true heart, like you can think of a six mana card, what stats would you need for it to be good? Not a 6-7, because Boulder Fist Ogre isn't being played. Would 6-10 be good enough? Possibly? Like, I have to think about what cards on the 6-mana place are even played just for the stats. I can't really think of any. So, we're going to compare this to, like, Dr. Boom, which is a 9-9, and has a bonus. So, like, what would be a good vanilla-based stat on a 6-mana card, then? Um, 6-11? 612? Or if you wanted to use attack value, like maybe 8-9? I mean a 6 mana 8-9 sounds pretty OP now that I think about it. 6 mana 8-8. Eight, eight. So basically you would need 2-5 extra, so that would be about 4 uses of the hero power. Anyways, the point that I'm getting at is, though this looks amazing, and it is amazing, you have to keep in mind that you're gonna put this in a deck which plans on using its hero power at least four times, uh, consistently, for it to be worth considering. But it is very cool, and I'll probably try to find some way to get this card to work, even though it seems like it'll be difficult to. In Arena, it's actually difficult to think about whether or not you can expect to use your hero power or something like four times also. I think it'll be okay in Arena. It's a slower format, but hard to say. Uh, I suppose a good comparison would be in Priest, you have a 3-mana uh, card, Shadow Form, which replaces your starting hero power with a better one, it's true. Uh, for 3-mana, you basically go up to deal 2 damage. So imagine if Shadow Form were in Mage, would it be Run? Hard to say, this card is actually a lot like Shadow Form. If you count the Shadow Form part of the card as worth 3-mana, then this is basically a 3-mana 6-3, which is pretty good, right? So many combos, this is probably one of the cards that requires uh, a lot of testing, to see whether or not it works, but rule of thumb, put it in a deck where you're planning to use your hero power four times. Next is Champion Sarad. Now that's an exciting Inspire card. Off of a 4-5 worth of stats, you would expect to pay four mana for it. So you're basically paying one mana for the ability, and the ability is pretty good. Uh, you draw a card. Not as good as drawing a card because it's a random spell and there are a lot of bad spells out there in Hearthstone, but I'm willing to basically treat this as draw a card. Now you oftentimes wouldn't play this as a 5 mana 4 5 because you can't really count on it immediately doing it, but if you have board control, yeah, you play it on turn 5. And then on turn 6 you use your hero power, of course. Uh, or you can think of it as turn 7, if you're behind you play it and then you use your hero power. And then you have like a 4 or 5 draw card, which actually isn't that exciting. So with Nexus Champion Sarad, you basically have to plan on using your hero power twice to make this good. And that can be difficult to do. So even though it looks amazing, it's like, eh? 
is it even that good? But one big thing to realize is this Nexus Champion Sarad does have kind of taunt. So when you think about it, 5 mana, 4, 5 taunt, that's not bad. But it's not really taunt is the problem. Uh, I do expect that this card will be in all the decks that use Inspire because it's not really 7 mana and using your hero power could be t uh, twice could be easier with cards that let you use your hero power twice or with cards that reduce the mana cost to one so you, uh, of your hero power so you can play Nexus Champion Serrat on turn six. In Arena, this card will be pretty good because you can count on the cards that add value over time. You can note that a lot of the Inspire cards are balanced around if you use the hero power once, it's kind of slightly less good than okay, or it's fair, and uh, that uses fair from a standpoint of Boulder Fist Ogre is fair or Yeti is fair, but it turns out that Yeti and Boulder Fist Ogre aren't being played, so realistically it's a little less good. So you really have to think about using Inspire like at least twice. Can you do it? We'll find out. Poison Blade. I looked at this card initially and I was like, what, are you serious? This card looks like it sucks. For this card to match Assassin's Blade, you need to spend 10 mana into it. You need to Poison Blade, and then Hero Power to make it a 2-3, and then Hero Power to make it a 3-3, and then Hero Power to make it a 4-3. It's the type of card where, like, in a perfect world, in your perfect world where the game lasts 10 turns on average, and you can somehow afford to spend like two mana each turn. In this magical fantasy, like, you kind of can use it, but it's real bad. The card is unfathomably bad. I look at this card and I actually have to think about what they were thinking, because the card is so bad. It could easily cost three mana, like maybe it could even cost two mana. It could easily have a higher durability or a higher attack value, but... Huh? Uh, it's real bad in Arena also. The idea behind Poison Blade is to actually give Rogue a reason to use their hero power, I suppose, so they can actually use their Inspire things. By the way, when it comes to Inspire, Rogue is getting the short end of the stick, that's true, because their hero power is often only usable every two turns to actually get value out of it. Well, the Poison Blade lets you sink your mana into Inspire cards with Rogue! Woo! It's not a good idea. I think uh, Rogue is probably one of the least likely classes that you're going to see an Inspire deck from. Unless its class cards of Inspire are really good. Or Inspire enablers. Poison Blade is not one of them. Lock and load! I love this card because... Well, I would say I would love any card which pushed Control Hunter to be a deck. Uh, I am generally very in favor of decks which, of cards, which create new deck archetypes. I, of course, am rooting for Control Hunter. This is exactly the type of card where I have to think about the best case scenario for the card to analyze whether or not it's playable or whether it's ridiculously overpowered. We're going to establish a baseline of a random Hunter card. Eh, the Hunter cards are on general like all right, maybe two random hunter cards could be considered kind of drawing two cards, but a little bit worse. So two mana, draw two cards, which are a little bit worse. Sure, that's fine. Uh, you look at Arcane Intellect, that's kind of being played in control type mages. So sure, you can play uh, a two mana, draw two slightly less good cards. So what about drawing three cards? Okay, then, then we're starting to talk. Two cards is like average and fair. Three cards are starting to get good. Uh, four cards, all right, now we're talking. So how likely is it for you to draw three cards with lock and load? You're spending your two mana on lock and load. You would probably be playing Hunter's Mark, so that's a zero mana, I'll give you a freebie. You would wanna be playing one mana cards if you were playing lock and load. Arcane Shot, Tracking, those are okay cards. You weaken the slight overall power of your deck, but that might be okay. Uh, so let's say you play a zero mana card, you play a one mana card, you play a two mana card. I don't even know if you have room for traps in a lock and load deck, but you play quick shot. So let's say on average you lock and load, you play Hunter's Mark, you play, art, you play tracking, and you play quick shot. 
I cost two for five mana and you're drawing three cards. I can see that as a like common type of thing. And most importantly, say you have the coin, that especially makes lock and load good. Animal Companion is just too good for you to not run even in a control hunter deck. I will say that there might not be room in for kill command in this type of hunter, but yeah, I can see all kinds of scenarios where you like late game, you lock and load, you play a slower card like Animal Companion, Hunter's Mark, you quick shot, you tracking, you're drawing four cards, you throw in the coin. Sometimes you lock and load and then lock and load again, and then you just draw a bunch of cards. That can be fun. And of course the cards you draw with lock and load can be used. So like sometimes you Hail Mary lock and load into a spell and then maybe you get a spell which is playable. Anyways, I think uh, this card could be the resurgence of a control hunter. Uh, there's already like control hunter ideas out there. Even without this card, it's been played. You'd play cards like Death Lord, Hunter's Mark, uh, Wild Pyromancer, Acolyte of Pain. It just fits right into that deck. So I like that idea. Spare parts do synergize with Lock and Load, but I can't really think of a synergetic way to get that to work. Uh, there's not that many ways to get spare parts as Hunter. I would be surprised if it was uh, more of a spare part lock and load combo. I, I think more reasonable would be an actual good spell. But you know, you could put Toshley in there. That's pretty fun. In Arena this card will suck because it's difficult to get spells in Arena. But in Constructed, Control Hunter, I'm excited. Here's one card that you won't see in Control Hunter. Ball of Spiders is a cool idea and I like the name, but it might cost a little too much. I, I want to say something. This card is better than it looks. When you look at it and you're like, what? I could summon three 1-1 one, one web spinners for three mana. Why am I spending six mana for it? But here's the thing to realize. Like, when you bundle cards together, it becomes a lot better because you're not summoning three 1-1s. One, like, if you're going to compare it to that, then it's basically three mana draw two cards. You play three mana on your arcane intellect, to draw two web spinners, and then you play three mana for the three web spinners. So when you think about it that way, like, Ball of Spiders is less bad. When you think of it as six mana, three three, draw three cards, you compare that with Nourish, which is five mana, draw three cards, and you're bundling it with one extra mana for a three three. So that's not bad. And I am saying draw three cards generously. I think this card could cost five mana. It probably should cast five mana, but it costs six mana. So that's too much, so it's no good. Also, it competes with the uh, Savannah High Main spot, and Savannah High Main is beating Ball of Spiders every day. Uh, in Arena, this card's actually going to be good, because it's a slow enough format where Nourish is a good card. So you're getting your Nourish, and you're getting a 3-3. Good deal. And you guys laugh, like, drawing Web Spinners is a bad deal, and then drawing, like, random cards is a bad deal. But a Web Spinner is a real card, and the Random Beast is often a real card. Onto the shaman cards. A two mana three four. Whoa. Overload one. And notably, it is a totem. The totem golem. This is Blizzard starting to realize that overload is not that much of a benefit. So they're actually adding the overload cost to the mana cost and being like, okay, we're going to give you a three mana three four. And we're actually going to give you a slight benefit because Overload lets you pay at 1 mana forward. And this is a fair card because Spider Tank is a 3 mana 3-4 three, and isn't being played much. When you look at this and you compare it with the old card, Feral Spirit, uh, that card was 3 plus 2. And you're getting a 2-3 and a 2-3, so it's like 5 mana 4-6. That's not very exciting. As a Shaman, you can now get board control really early play this on turn 2 or even coin it on turn 1. Board control early is better than board control late because you can actually start getting your favorable trades in. Like you get this guy on turn 1, you can kill their knife juggler on turn 2, and you can have it survive. It's a big deal. The fact that it's a totem is uh, going to probably be good with the other shaman cards too. Totemic might hype. Uh, in arena this card will be amazing because it's all about board control. Uh, probably a top tier card. In Constructed, you could actually see it being played in both control decks just because you have something small early that has a high health value that can take the edge off of aggro decks. 
you can put it in the more aggressive type too because it's two mana three four it's pretty good in aggressive decks Tuskar Totemic is actually an interesting card to transition into three mana three two summon any random totem not just your hero power totems but any random totem uh, also worth mentioning that if you have a taunt totem out you can also get another taunt totem Looking at Tuskar Totemic, one of the things to consider is that usually you're paying two mana for a random totem. So Tuskar Totemic lets you basically use your hero power and you get a 3-2. So that's the bundle and you're basically paying one mana for a 3-2. So that seems like a very fair deal. Except, yes, you can't really consider that paying two mana for a totem is a good deal. It's not a good deal because the hero power tends to be worth about one mana. So then it's basically a 2 mana 3 2 battle cry about a 1 mana effect. Now this does have some variance though because there are two notable totems which are really good. The first totem that's really good is mana tide totem. You'd pay 3 mana for that all day. So you have a 1 8 chance of getting that. And you have a 1 8 chance of getting one very special totem as Maz got off of me twice during the July 22nd uh, showcase match, you can get Totem Golem with Tuskar Totemic, and then you get a 3 mana 3 2 with a extra 3 4 attached, and that's insane. But obviously, you can only count on that 1 8th of the time. Uh, the other totems you can get are Flame Tongue Totem and the Healing Totem. The Healing Totem isn't very exciting, it's so exciting that I forgot the name of it, and the Flame Tongue Totem is pretty good sometimes. Worth mentioning that if you play to Tuskar Totemic, like here's a strategy tip one month in advance, make sure to put your Tuskar Totemic to the left side so that you can summon the Flame Tongue Totem, and then like you can go with it. Summons always go on the right side of the guy you summon it on. That uh, card seems fair, but it's difficult to see whether or not a fair card is powerful enough to run in a constructed deck. In Arena though, this card uh, is sturdy enough to definitely run, and is a solid card. Easy comparison to Razor Fen Hunter because the 0-2 totems are kind of compared to 1-1 one, one totems, and you're getting 3-2 instead of 2-3, so that's a card to consider it to be compared with. And when you compare it with Razor Fen Hunter, you're like, ah, that's not actually that good. So I don't think it'll be run, unless the uh, totem synergy is really real. And here is a synergetic totem card. A lot of cards in Hearthstone would be a lot better if you nicked one mana off of their card, there'd be like someone would be borderline imbalanced. Frostwolf Warlord is a card which I think if you cut one mana off, it wouldn't be that OP. I actually think you could buff Frostwolf Warlord to a 4 4, and no serious changes in the metagame would happen. So that's bad news for a Draenei Totem Carver because. It only gets a plus one, plus one for each friendly totem. So that's basically the Frostwolf Warlord being buffed uh, a bit, but still not being good enough because Frostwolf Warlord was never played, and a buff of one mana to that card wouldn't be that great. I mean, uh, ideally you're getting this to be a 6-6, six, six, so you dodge battle game hunter. <laughs> the game hunter's battle cry. It turns out that uh, people are always clearing the shaman totems anyways, though, so... Yeah. I uh, usually can't get away with sneaky sneaky totem totem into drainy drain eye totem carver. It's not going to work. I will say though that in Arena, Frostal Forlord is considered a reasonable card or even a good card. So drain eye totem carver, that's fine. Uh, 4 mana, 4 4, not good, but like, eh, passable sometimes. And turn 6, you can play a totem and you play a 4 mana, 5 5. Sure. Thunder Bluff Valiant. Now this is a fun Inspire. When we were talking at, on the day of the revealed cards, Kriparian was saying something along the lines of, Hey, I, I, saw a, I saw a Shaman press the button to summon a totem and then he got bloodlusted. Well, that's kind of the same thing. It's somewhat similar. So you play this on turn 5. By the way, this is an interesting card because you can actually play this on turn 5. It's got 6 health. So... That's pretty tough for a turn 5 play. Uh, the stats are obviously... Well, well, I mean, I was going to say the stats are obviously not up to par for a turn for a 5-mana card, but 
five mana four six if that's the standard well really a five mana five six should be the standard none exist yet but that's about what a five mana card is worth uh, but the most important thing is the health, so you can reasonably play it on turn 5. Uh, if you have this on turn 7, it's kind of like a bloodlust, uh, but it's permanent, which is kind of nice. So, say you have a totem out, it's kind of like Quartermaster. You press the button, you play the Thunder Bluff, well, no, actually, you do it the other way around. You play the Thunder Bluff Valiant, and then you press the button. Since Inspire happens after you push the button, uh, then you basically gave two totems plus attack, usually, hopefully. That's a 5 mana 7 6 worth of value, and that's great. And even if you only hit it on one totem, you got a 5 mana 5 6. It's cool to see that this is actually a something that like a grinder shaman could put in. Uh, I look forward to it because I want there to be a control type of shaman, as opposed to mid-range shaman, like you go into the late game and you actually win a shaman by grinding out with totems. So cool, Thunder Bluff Valiant. In Arena, this card will be uh, pretty good as well, because it's kind of like Quartermaster, in that you can actually get to turn 7, and then play Totem, and then Thunder Bluff... Well, sorry. I keep thinking, like, you put, put Totem first, but no, you play the Thunder Bluff Valiant first, and then you push the button so that the Inspired Totem gets attack. And yes, because Inspire happens after you push the button, there is the added effect. Your summon totem does get plus two attack, if you haven't understood that by me alluding to it already. The mage cards, Fallen Hero. This is a great card. Two mana, three two, with a major upside. I had earlier hypothesized about how good uh, shadow form would be, and this is basically a two mana, three two, and you shadow form, because your hero of power does two damage instead of one. So not only is it fair stats, you've attached a three mana card spell of shadow form into the card. So it's really good. Uh, you're going to see this card in all the inspired decks just because it's that powerful. The question is though, is it good enough to put into like currently standing decks such as Tempo Mage? And hesitant to say yes on that. Because, as Tempo Mage, you're not really looking to use your hero power that much. It perhaps fits more in slower decks. Duplicating this is fun, because you can play Fallen Hero, Fallen Hero, and then deal 3 damage with your hero power. It just seems like a very sturdy card. In Arena, this card's actually going to be insane. Because, if you coin out the Fallen Hero, <laughs> then you can just deal 2 damage to whatever they play on turn 2. Worth mentioning, it should be straightforward since the text is on the card of Fallen Hero that your hero power does one extra damage. This isn't a permanent addition, it only adds while the Fallen Hero is on the board. Effigy, this is a cool secret. It's very similar to Duplicate. Whenever a friendly minion dies, get an effect. It's faster than Duplicate because it immediately goes on the board. Firebat and I were having a, a discussion about the card, and Firebat was saying, Cool, this is a nice card to uh, put into the usual Tempo Mage. Uh, there was a problem with the Mirror Entities earlier, that if you only put in two Mirror Entities, you were often struggling to find one more secret to put in. Counter Spell, Duplicate, but Effigy fits right in. It's actually fast enough to take into effect, and you'll often get something reasonable, like if the secret is free from Mad Scientist, then Basically, the battle, the death rattle of Mad Scientist would be on average some uh, random two cost minion. And that seems good. But another way of thinking about Effigy is that you do get a random minion with the same cost. So you could also play this in a control deck. You play a big card, you play Effigy, and then your opponent is forced somehow to kill your big card. It can even be something as simple as Sludge Belcher. And then you get a random five drop. And that's completely reasonable. It's pretty good. You're getting a random 5 drop for 3 mana. Cool. Just like uh, Duplicate doesn't trigger off of Mad Scientist dying, so doesn't Effigy. So yeah, two different ways to play Effigy. One is to put it as your third secret on top of the two mirror entities with your traditional Mad Scientist aggro deck, or to put it in a control deck, a uh, grinder deck, and play the Effigy, play the Sludge Belcher, get a bit of value out of your 3 mana a card which ends up being a 5 mana card, and if you get the Effigy through Mad Scientist, then it's like your Mad Scientist has Death Rattle summon a 
random five mana cost minion, should you combo it with the obvious Sludge Belcher choice. Finally, last but not least, we have Kaldar Drake is a really cool card. People look at it and their eyes like grow really big when they see their when they see the text on the Kaldara Drake. You can use your hero power any number of times. Wow, that's incredible. But have you ever stopped to think about how insignificant a hero power often is? Uh, you play the Kaldara Drake on turn six. On turn seven, you can use the hero. You can use all your mana to deal three damage with Fire Blast. That's not that amazing. So where Kaldara Drake excels is when you combo it with the other cards. Now I've only seen just a few cards so far, but even in the cards revealed so far, there's already a pretty sick combo, and I was able to play that deck in July 22nd's release preview showcase tournament. You combo it with Maiden of the Lake. That's a 4 mana card, though it costs a lot of mana to combo with, but say you manage to have your Maiden of the Lake out earlier, you play the Kaldara Drake, say it's turn 10, you get to Fire Blast immediately four times. Or the other way around, you play the Kaldara Drake, and then you play the Maiden of the Lake on turn 10, and you get to Fire Blast six times. And that's pretty cool. Obviously that requires a really late game strategy, but you don't need to rely on it because the two cards are independently strong enough. Uh, you can easily play turn 4 Maiden, you can play turn 6 Kaldara, turn 7, you Fire Blast seven times. That's the dream. Well, that's not actually the complete dream. The real dream is then you play Nexus Champion Sarad, and then you start fire blasting for one mana each turn, and then you, uh, every turn, repeatedly, and then you draw a random spell each time you do. That's the dream, but how realistic is that dream? It's not that realistic. But the good news is I don't think this is meant to be like a combo. Obviously, the three cards work together in combination pretty well, but the cards might be independently strong enough that you would run them anyways. Uh, you would want to mix in, of course, the other strong cards that work with the f uh, hero ability, such as Fallen Mage. But yes, that's a deck right there. With the proper defense, maybe you can make this value deck work. I don't think it's that smart to trust and rely on the combination of having all of those cards together but it should be more thought of of if it happens that's nice but if it doesn't happen then okay I've got a 6 mana 6 6 I can use the hero power sometimes I've got a 4 mana 2 6 if I use the hero power once that's kind of value I've got a 5 mana 4 5 if I use the hero power twice with that it's kind of value uh, I'm being told it's called the fallen hero uh, just imagine I said fallen hero it's okay. We can leave that in. Fallen Mage people will understand what it is. I think the Kaldara Drake is a card that looks better than it actually is. In practice, it's really hard to actually combo with Kaldara Drake because it's a 6 mana combo starter card, so you only have 4 mana left over. But with Emperor Thorsan, miracles can happen. But not only is it a 6 mana combo, you have to combo it with the 4 mana card which makes your hero power 1. But the point is the cards might be independently strong enough to use anyways. In Arena, I think this card is going to be pretty good because uh, you can get into the late game. 6 mana 6-6 six, six is already pretty reasonable anyways, and it's a nice bonus that you can just machine gun fire blast. Being able to control where your fire blasts go is really useful. Uh, it is also a dragon, so you might see some kind of mage dragon deck appear. The dragon deck for mage was almost there anyways. Uh, you would have your Azure Drakes, you would have your Twilight Drakes, you would have your Blackwing Technicians, you would have your Blackwing Corruptors, and now you have another consistent Drake, the Kaldara Drake. Uh, dragon decks always tend to be control anyways. Uh, you have a lot of control elements in Inspire, which encourages you to be control and go for the late game. And we have finished reviewing the cards. Unless I missed any. All right. No, I should say some kind of, like, epilogue. So all in all, this is a promising start to the set. You can kind of get the flavor of it, and it's clearly meant to have cards which encourage long-term value through the Inspire mechanic, and perhaps move things towards a more control style. And that's something that I love. I like having the ability to gain value over time. 
Now the problem is I don't quite see how you're going to gain value over time if you die too early. So hopefully we're going to see some anti-aggro cards or some ways to stem the bleeding so you can actually get the value. Thanks for watching this first review of just the first 19 cards of the more than 130 cards that are going to come out. Hopefully we see some measures to be able to live so that you can obtain the value from these cards.